to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Pee Wee Valley Baptist Church in Pee Wee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to begin our verse-by-verse study in the book of Titus. Turn, if you will, to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, and we're going to begin uh, our study in Titus today, having finished the other two pastoral epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy, and so we'll do some introduction to this book, as well as begin a study in the first few verses. But let's read those first few verses first, if you will. Stand with me if you're able beginning in chapter 1 and verse 1 of the book of Titus, where the Lord says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the world began but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, my known son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Father, touch our hearts with your word this morning, and not just touch, but penetrate our hearts that your word will find depth within our hearts and our souls, our minds, uh, that we would understand it through the power of the Holy Spirit, and that we would act appropriately upon it as our circumstance dictates. Deal generously with us with your word, give us understanding of it, and be our guide as we go through your word today. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. So this, um, this letter to Titus was written by Paul, and you see that in the first verse, Paul, an apostle, and in verse 4, to Titus. So written by Paul to Titus is understandable, um, and um, it was written uh, between his first Roman imprisonment and his second Roman imprisonment. It's not a... Um, uh, a, a letter that he wrote while he was in prison, but it's more likely that he was around uh, the area of Corinth somewhere in Macedonia when he wrote this, according to evidence from the scriptures, in around 62 to 66 AD. Different people will give you a different take on that. There's a range at which it could have actually been written. And it was written before 1 Timothy was written, uh, uh, excuse me, it was written after 1 Timothy was written and before 2 Timothy, so it was written in between those two, if you will. Titus was a pastor, much like Timothy was. Uh, Timothy was serving uh, in Ephesus. Uh, Titus was serving in the island of Crete, which is in the Mediterranean, uh, and needing support out there and encouragement. Uh, Paul writes to Titus this letter and um, it appears that there were things that were lacking in the ministry there, things that Titus could have done in order to improve the effectiveness of God's work there as Titus was uh, heading up that work of the Lord individually, if you will. Uh, in verse 5 of this text, it tells us, uh, for this cause left I thee in Crete. So that's where he was. Paul had been there with him and then left and then writes this letter to him because Paul had noticed that some things were lacking, uh, much as he wrote to Timothy that there were things lacking in the ministry. I don't believe there's a ministry uh, that, is, uh, that is in existence that there's not something lacking in the ministry. There's always something more that we can do. If we ever think that we've got the ministry, that's the ministry of all ministries, uh, we're wrong. <laughs> we've got to continue to do more work, if you will. Now, according to um, Galatians chapter 2, and we'll hop around just a little bit here, 
uh, to talk about Titus a little bit. But in Galatians chapter 2, we find out that Titus uh, is uh, a pure Greek, if you will. If you look at Galatians chapter 2 and the first verse, the scripture says there, uh, then 14 years later, after, 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them who have reputation, lest by any means uh, I should uh, run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And we understand that Titus' mother and father were both of Greek descent, and so he was a pure Greek, if you will. Now, if you turn over to 2 Timothy and chapter 4, it's just back a page or two uh, from our text this morning. Uh, there we see um, that Titus likely had been with Paul uh, during his final imprisonment. It says in chapter 4 and verse 9 there, it says, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. That's what Paul wrote to Timothy. And in verse 10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, uh, Crescens, and to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. So Titus was there with him while he was in prison, and then he left uh, to go to Dalmatia, no doubt to continue ministry there. Um, and since this was between his two imprisonments, likely it was uh, after his first, uh, during his first imprisonment when Titus uh, had visited him. Um, and we understand that Paul had some issues after his second imprisonment where there weren't many there attending to him. Uh, but if you go back to Titus chapter 1 and look at verse 4, uh, it tells us that Titus is called, Paul calls him, mine own son, uh, after the common faith. So no doubt uh, Paul had led uh, Titus uh, in, in putting his faith in Christ. And if not that, he had at least trained him and had been a mentor to him as he discipled him uh, as a young believer and to enable him uh, through the teaching and instruction to go on to be a pastor there in the island of Crete. So he was Paul's uh, son in the ministry and much like Timothy was the same way. Paul uses the same language to talk about Timothy. And uh, it's that mentoring and discipleship that brings people to the point where they can go on their own and they can establish ministry themselves. I know when I went and told my pastor that um, God had called me into the ministry and my pastor never talked to me about that. And we had been there several years, was saved in that church and you know we were working in the church. Um, uh, I was teaching son, uh uh, the, the youth programs, uh, I was teaching the, the uh, junior church program, Mary was teaching in the Sunday schools, we were active in the church, uh, and the pastor never mentioned uh, pastoring or being a preacher to me, about me personally. Um, and I really, really appreciate that after much time, but uh, when I went and told him that the Lord had called me into ministry, and this was after, I told you before, about three years of struggling with the Lord's call on my life. And it was a struggle. Um, and, and I finally succumbed and said yes to the Lord. Uh, and I went and told him, I'll never forget, I, he, he didn't even hesitate. He didn't even hesitate. He said, um, he said, okay. I told him, gave him the story. He said, okay. He says, you're preaching Sunday night. I said, what? <laughs> and then he, and then he, he said, now, you did tell me that the Lord called you to preach. I said, yes. He says, well, then you're preaching Sunday night. And you know what? I couldn't refute that. And I left and, you know, I was all beside. It was a Wednesday night. I only had a couple of days to get prepared. Um, yeah, I taught Sunday school classes and I had taught youth classes and I had, um, and I had taught the junior um, church program ages 5 to 12. But, you know, I hadn't taught adults before. And uh, a whole church full, we had probably 150 people on a Sunday morning. And for a guy who was afraid to get up, even in a class of 5 to 12-year-olds, and talk about things, I was frightened to death. 
And I had to keep reminding myself, the Lord called me to preach. And I believe the, uh, the pastor, and I thank him for giving me that shock value. If the Lord called you to preach, the message was, he didn't say it directly, the message was, if God called you to preach, he'll have a message for you come Sunday night. Uh, and the Lord did have a message, and I and I'm seeming to my in my opinion, I messed it all up. I had so many notes I couldn't even keep up with myself. Everybody was kind and nice and said great job, did good and all that. But I learned my lesson that first night. But the important thing is that when I when I told my pastor that God called me into the ministry, he gave me immediate opportunity to start doing the work that God had called me to do. He didn't, I didn't have to wait two or three years. I was the first week right there in the pulpit. And eventually within a couple of years, I was doing, we had, my pastor was living four messages on Sunday and a message on Wednesday. He was doing five sermons a week. And it wasn't long before I was doing five sermons a week. And that's a lot of sermons. Now keep in mind, I was working 10 to 12 hours a day. Uh, and I was uh, running 10 miles a day. I was um, active in the elementary school PTA. I was the president. I was active in the Gideon's ministry. I was president of the Gideon's, and I had a whole host of other things. I was coaching soccer. I had a whole host of things that were going on, and I was a very busy person, and eventually I got to that point where the, the pastor gave me that responsibility but what a growing and maturing experience it was. Um, and I was on, on the line. And here's my pastor of some 30, 40 years sitting in the front. He never sat anywhere else, right there. He sat right in the first seat in the first row. And I did everything I could to look away from him and, <laughs> and try to not notice that he was there. But it was a constant reminder to me that God is listening to every word and he knows my heart. And so it was God's representative sitting there holding me accountable. But after three years of preaching and teaching the truth, then that pastor, along with the deacons of the church, they ordained me into the ministry. But so in a sense there, I was his own son in the ministry, just like here, when Paul wrote to Titus, he wrote this to Titus. It says, my own son after the common faith. And so I understand that. I get it. I've been in, his, I've been in Titus's shoes. Uh, and it's a, very, it's a very responsible, and it, 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 just, it has the gravity like nothing else. Now, the scriptures say that, um, that, you shouldn't be one who really wants to jump out and start teaching the Word. It's probably the most important thing, and that's what God laid on my heart early on. This was the most important. I was, in busy, I was busy with a lot of things, but this was the most important thing I could ever do, was to teach the Word of God. And having a pastor who supported that was like having a Paul to support Titus there. It was having that support, having that encouragement, having holding me accountable. And even coming here, when, when Dr. Hauser came to the church, I thought what a blessing it was. He would encourage me, and he oftentimes gave me constructive criticism. And I asked him for that. I said, as often as the Lord lays it on your heart, give it to me. If you think you're going to forget it, put it in an email. He wrote me a lot of emails. We talked a lot. And so in a real sense... Uh, Dr. Hauser has been a mentor uh, to me, and I, I've been a disciple of his for some time. And it's been very encouraging, and all of these things work together to grow. So Titus was one who had that great um, uh, missionary, Paul, uh, who, who in, by inspiration of God, wrote so much material on how to live our life righteously. And Titus had that available to him on a, on a regular basis there personally and then here by letter as he writes to him. Um, and in verse 5 again, not only did Paul leave him there in Crete to be the pastor of that church, but he told him to get things in order. Things were not in order there. He says the, that thou should set in order the things that are wanting. There were things lacking in the church that needed to be established. And I know when when I left the church that I was saved in and that I was ordained in and I went to another church, uh, when I got there, 
and I didn't. I, I, I felt like I was out from under that uh, that advice and counsel and direction and guidance and being held responsible by somebody. And it's like now it's it's before God Himself. And I always felt that way, but it had more gravity on me at that time. And I felt the obligation to do. When I read back to the pastoral epistles. Paul wrote to Timothy and to Titus, there's things that are lacking in the church and you need to take care of them. Uh, and, and as I went on my first pastorate alone, boy, was that, a, was that ever a battle. Uh, it sounds easy. Oh, just go do this and just go do that and do the other. Well, guess what? There's a whole world of resistance out there to the things that God wants done in His house. Um, I mean, even as we, you know, get into the, um, into the, uh, the, the, the order that was to be established first was the preacher in verse seven, that he must be blameless, steward of God, not self-willed, etc., and he must be the um, a, a one woman man. And today, there's resistance to that. There are people serving in pastorates and in preaching positions uh, and in ministry positions who are not. Uh, they've been divorced and remarried and perhaps not even under uh, the, the conditions that, uh, that, that allow that, such as the death of your wife, till death do you part. And so there's resistance against all kinds of things where Paul wrote to Timothy and says, the women aren't to preach or to usurp authority. How many churches today have women preachers? Uh, and, and when you're setting in order the things that God wants, it's not an easy task and it's not popular. Oh, there are people that will support it. They don't tell you much. The ones you hear from are the ones that oppose setting in order the things that are done. So Titus had that mentorship and discipleship by Paul to help equip him as God equipped him for the ministry to do those things. Uh, Titus is mentioned several times in 2 Corinthians. I want to stop and take a look at a couple of those. Tells us a little bit about Titus uh, as we get into the book where Paul's instructing him on how to put the church in order and the things that are important as he does so. But if you go to second chapter of 2 Corinthians, chapter 2 and verse 13. The scriptures there, I had no rest for my spirit because I found not Titus, my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from there into Macedonia. Titus was one who provided great comfort and companionship and fellowship to Paul. And Paul felt a loss when he didn't have Titus with him. And we know that Titus spent some time with him. He spent some time with him while he was in jail. He spent some time with him there, but he spent time with him in other places. And Titus was important to him. And it was a, it was a great loss for him not to have Titus around. If you go to chapter 7 and verse 6, um, there it says, Nevertheless, God, who comforteth those who are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. We see that reiteration of that. Titus was such an encourager uh, uh, that God sent to Paul. And Paul, who was oftentimes in travail and distress and downhearted and discouraged by so many things, Titus was that person that God used in order to give him encouragement. In verse 13, there in uh, chapter 7, Therefore we were comforted in your comfort, speaking to the Corinthians, yea, uh, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus because his spirit was refreshed by you all. Y'all is the word uh, where I come from. But the thing is that Titus was one who brought encouragement to Paul from Corinth. This is the second letter to the Corinthians. After the first letter, the Corinthians had improved dramatically. They weren't where they needed to be yet, but they improved dramatically. And so Titus brought that news to Paul. And Paul, who had given them that stern rebuke that is the entire book of 1 Corinthians, uh, we're studying about the, the, the issue they had with uh, the false use of the gift of tongues in chapter 14, but the book is filled with problems, and that's Paul addresses the problems in the church. And Titus goes there after Paul writes that first letter and brings back to Paul encouraging words that things are improving spiritually. Uh, and it says in verse 14 there, 
For if I have boasted anything to, of, to him of you, I am not ashamed. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our boasting which I made before Titus is found uh, truth, to be truth. Uh, and so Paul had hoped that his efforts there and his ministry and all the labor there and the letter that he had written would actually take root and be effective in improving the spiritual situation there, and it was. And that news came by, came by way of Titus. In chapter 8 in 2 Corinthians, if you look at verse 16, he says, But thanks be to God who put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. Oh, Titus not only giving back to Paul out of Paul's discipleship to him, but Titus giving to the Corinthians that which was necessary when he was there. And so Titus was effective as a minister, even in Corinth, uh, while Paul was absent from them. We see that there in verse 16 and verse 23 of chapter 8. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper, literally fellow worker or fellow laborer concerning you, um, or our brethren being uh, inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches in the glory of Christ. So it identifies Titus here as a messenger, which is a minister, if you will, of the Lord working there in Corinth. And again, he encourages the Corinthians uh, with the work that Titus was doing there. And then one more time in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, if you look at verse 18, it says, I uh, desired, that means exhorted, Titus, and with him I sent a brother, not identified here. Did Titus make a gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? In other words, did Titus go in and try to take advantage of you? Was he preaching and taking your money and not being effective in, 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 in not only preaching the gospel, but in giving godly counsel to the people and being an example to them in righteousness? He said, did Titus make a gain of you? The, and it's a rhetorical question. No, he didn't. And it was obvious to them. It says, walk we not in the same spirit? Yes, they did. And so Titus was proven to be an equal partner as a fellow laborer of Paul in the ministry there at Corinth as well. And he says, the last question there, walk we not in the same steps? Our doctrine is aligned because it's the truth. We're both dealing out of the scriptures. The problem in Corinth was at this point, there were a lot of false teachers. As we go to Titus, we're going to see false teachers. False teachers showed up in every situation in the New Testament. And so Paul had to guard against those false teachers. And so Paul was trying to be supportive of Titus and reminding the Corinthians that, yes, what you're hearing from Titus is the same thing you're hearing from me because we're both dealing with the truth. This isn't a fake gospel. This is the real deal. And so... Let's go back to the book of Titus, if you will. And in chapter 1, and verse 1, uh, I want to talk about the doctrines that are included in this book. The doctrines that are included. First of which is election. Paul writes to Titus in chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect. He was God's elect and acknowledging the truth which is after godliness. What does elect mean? Now, you know, there's an extreme group that goes way out there. They're called Calvinists. And they say, well, you don't, you don't even have to put your faith in Christ because you're either saved before the foundation of the world or you're not. But everybody has to put faith in Christ. And the thing over here is, elect means picked out or chosen. It means picked out. God, for those who have been saved by the grace of God, or will be saved by the grace of God, God chose you. He picked you out as an individual. Now, this is hard for us to understand because we are, and we're going to talk about uh, the elect, but we are predestined. We're predestinated. Uh, God determined beforehand uh, who we would be. And um, it's not like we don't have a free will because we still have a free will. 
The finite mind has a very difficult time wrapping around things like eternity. I mean, we, we go, if you ever go up to the, um, uh, to the Creation Museum and you look at the video that they show, the one that I saw when I went there, it talks about the actual extent of what is known as a universe to us. And it only scratches the surface of what's beyond at our best estimates. And what we do know about is literally trillions of miles away. And God put this vast array of solar systems and stars and planets and moons into existence and, and, and even the existence of here on earth to understand the motion of the earth, the motion of the sun, the role that the moon plays in, 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 in gravity and effects on the earth like tides and things like that. And God did all of that. And he did that, but eternity. It's hard for us to understand the concept that, that God is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end. There is no beginning with God. He is the beginning. He's from eternity until eternity. It's hard for us to understand because we know things are made. And so we want to know who made God. And people, there's a whole lot of people still trying to figure out who made God. Though if they actually believe there's a God, they want to know who made him. God is God. Uh, when Moses said, who am I going to tell the people you are? He said, tell them I am. It's it. I am. And, and we need to accept that because we certainly can't understand it. We'll be able to understand it when the Lord raptures the church and takes us home to heaven. Then we'll have full understanding. But right now, our finite mind, we're going to have a, a transformed body then. Right now, we can't understand it. And it's hard to understand election. But before the foundation of the world, everyone that puts faith in Christ was elected. They were picked out and chosen by God. You say, well, that's not just. It is just because God is a just God. The problem is we don't understand uh, how that works. But the point uh, of the doctrine in the text is around the issue, at least one of them, is around the issue of election. And it's sovereign election. It's from one who is perfect in every way, one who is holy and just in every way. And then in chapter 2 and verse 11, saving grace is another doctrine in the scriptures. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, uh, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purity unto himself, a people of his own, zealous of good works. Uh, the people of his own is a peculiar people, uh, but it literally means we're God's own people. So this saving grace, if you will, and the godliness that's expected and the righteous life that's expected when we're saved by the grace of God, the second coming of the Lord that we see there in verse 13, that appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the substitutionary atonement that was done in verse 14, how he gave himself for us, that we... Uh, might be redeemed from all iniquity and, um, and purify unto himself his own people. So those are some of the doctrines. And of course, in chapter 3 and verse 5, we see uh, the holy doctrine of the Holy Spirit, uh, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And it's that role of the Holy Spirit renewing of us. And we'll touch more on that as we get into the, the text of this book. But just to outline this, chapter 1 uh, talks about the organization of the work to set things in order, the requirements for the elders. It's reiterated here. It was given in uh, 1 Timothy. Now it's repeated uh, to Titus as Titus is to take the same effect. And it's a little bit different wording, but it's the same meaning and the same principles uh, that should be set in order as Timothy was instructed. Uh, and of course, at the end of chapter 1, a need for a very strong stand and to be steadfast in the midst of false teachers. 
uh, chapter 2 uh, is instruction on righteousness and Christian conduct. People say, well, you know, the Bible is not a list of things to do. It is. We're saved by grace, not by works. But once we've been saved by grace, James says faith without works is dead. It's not real faith. So when we're saved by grace, the Bible tells us, it gives us commands. There's lots of commands in the scriptures to do this, don't do that. A lot of people don't like to be told, do this, don't do that. But the Lord gives it to us regularly. We have a regular diet of that if we spend any time in the word of God. And the third chapter uh, is our conduct towards the world. Once we know how to live righteously uh, before God, we need to know how to live uh, in the midst of, the, of an ungodly world. And of course, the end of chapter three talks about ungodly teaching. Um, and I want to just point out one more thing before we get into the uh, little bit of this verse by verse here. And that is the emphasis on God's saving work. It's in this uh, book. In chapter 1 and verse 3, and this, and, and this comes to light as you just look at these six verses. Two in, verse, two in chapter 1, two in chapter 2, two in chapter 3. In chapter 1 and verse 3, we see the phrase, God our Savior, at the end of the verse. God our Savior. If we look in verse 4, we'll see at the end of the verse, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. If you look at chapter 2 and verse 10, the scripture says, Now purloining but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior, God our Savior. In verse 13 of chapter 2 at the end, the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In chapter 3 in verse 4, it says, But after the kindness and love of God our Savior. And in verse 6, we see which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. There's an absolute emphasis on the saving work of God in this book of Titus. And we don't want to miss that point. No, go back to chapter 1 and verse 1. I want to point out a couple of things before our time is up today. And that is, first and foremost, Paul was surrendered to God. Paul was surrendered to God. Um, and, and why do I want to point that out? Now, we've, we've studied much in the, in the letters that Paul has written, all inspired by God. It's not Paul's work. It's God's work. Paul was the man that God used to, to do much of the New Testament work, at least for the epistles. And what we find here is we've studied about what Paul has written. Paul himself, uh, he was a committed, faithful servant to the Lord. We don't want to lift Paul up. We want to lift the Lord up for enabling Paul to do that. And each of us are, are likewise in the same ship, if you will. But we need to be like Paul was. He says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and a knowledging of the truth, which are after godliness, a servant of God. A servant of God is a slave of God. When we're saved by the grace of God, we're no longer our own. We've been bought with a price. Just like a slave in the days of slavery and in the Old Testament days, there was a price on their body and they had an owner. Slaves did. And so it's the same sense here of being a slave to God. That's what he says. Literally a slave of God, a servant of God. The same word is translated slave in our scriptures. So we are at God's beck and call at all times. And I'll say this, Paul could never have accomplished the work that he did had he not been surrendered to God. Had he not been fully surrendered to God, he could not have accomplished that. And I wonder how much of our unwillingness and our experience not to fully surrender to God has kept God from working so effectively through us. Because effectiveness from God works through those who are fully committed and devoted to God's will, to perform His will, and to push God's agenda and not our own. He was surrendered to God. He was a servant of God. And, um, and that was first and foremost. That's what he mentions. Paul, he identifies himself first as a servant of God. A servant of God. 
I'm a slave. Paul, who are you? I'm a slave. Uh, who's your owner? God is. That's Paul's introduction. Uh, and it's not a rare introduction. It's a typical introduction for him. He placed himself totally under the divine and sovereign authority of God. And he sought to please God in all that he did. You see a phrase that Paul uses oftentimes, that I have a good conscience towards God. And that's the essence of being totally surrendered to him. Is that when whatever you do, at the end of the day, your conscience isn't bothering you because I didn't get something done or because I've done something that's inconsistent, or I didn't seek God's counsel in order to do something. There's many ways things can go wrong in our life. But if we're fully committed, devoted, and surrendered to God, things turn out differently. And God uses us as a, at that point, a vessel of honor. And God accomplishes His will through us. We may not understand why we're doing what we're doing. We may, and we may appear to people to do one thing today and something else tomorrow. And people say, he can't make his mind up. It may be the Lord changing our direction. But one thing we know is that service to God requires total surrender. Uh, and the slave was the most servile of all people in that day that Paul uh, wrote to this. And he says here, it's the only time Paul uses the phrase servant of God. It's the only time he uses the phrase servant of God. And, um, and, you, you, and, and so you, you might want to pay attention to that. Uh, some believe, and I, I do as well, that it's no doubt a, probably a reference to those like Moses and Joshua and others, uh, including Jeremiah, who we talked about uh, in our uh, adult Bible study earlier this morning. But in uh, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 2, and I want to say these things just uh, blankly there, but Joshua chapter 1 and verse 2, because the power is in the Scriptures, not in my speech. But in Joshua 1 and verse 2, it says, Moses, my servant. And who is this that's speaking? It's the Lord in verse 1. God says, Moses is my servant. And then if you look at the end of the book of Joshua, regarding Joshua himself, uh, in Joshua chapter 24, and go over to verse 29, the scripture says, um, uh, It came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And they were, and Jeremiah is called a servant of God as well. And what we find is Paul likely trying to identify with Titus here and with the audience because this was not just written for Titus to read but it was written for the churches it was written for all believers it was written for unbelievers they might read and find the truth so this was given to all people for all all ages since it was written and the point is Paul is not just an author he's a servant of God because there are a lot of people out there teaching. There's churches full uh, today of, of people who have leaders, preachers, and pastors. They're evangelists and missionaries out on the mission field. How do we know if what they're teaching is right or not? Well, you can't just say, well, I'm a servant of God, and that be it. Because what you say has to align with the truth. The Bereans had it right, right? Over in Acts 17, 11. They searched the scriptures daily to make sure what they were saying is right. But there were a lot of false teachers and they mixed a lot of truth in with a little bit of error. That's what the false teachers did. I mean, the Jewish, uh, the Jewish Jews uh, who had not put faith in Christ were trying to teach people, no, faith alone is not good enough. You have to still abide by the law and then you have to have faith too. But you gotta, you got to do the law. That's what makes you a righteous person. It sort of sounds logical and a lot of people still believe that today. I mean, we understand the, the New Testament has, is, is a new testament. And there are people around today that are still claiming that we have to do the, the, the Ten Commandments. Uh, and so what is wrong with doing the Ten Commandments? Uh, nothing is wrong with doing the Ten Commandments, but it's a part of the Mosaic Law. And the Mosaic Law says we need to sacrifice animals 
and shed their blood in order that we we say, well, Christ has already shed the blood the, the, and, 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 and it's sufficient. Well, yeah, but if you're going to abide, if you're going to abide by the law, you've got to shed some animals and a sacrifice on an altar to please God and to be forgiven for your sins. What about the high priest who has to have, where's your temple? Where's your high priest? The one who's going to make atonement for your sins. That's all part of the Mosaic law. Where's your ark, right? Where's this? Where's that? Where's the other? And there's a lot of elements of the Old Testament that have been done away with because we're living in an age of grace. By the grace of God are we saved, not by the works of the flesh, but by the grace of God. So they try to mix in a little bit and say, well, you know, faith's okay, but... And there were false teachers doing all kinds of teaching. Paul had to come on solely on the authority of God because God, uh, Paul didn't have... Anything but what? The scriptures to prove he was right. That's all he had. Oh, all he had? It's more than sufficient. It's everything you need, in fact. The scriptures are all you need. And, and the evidence in our world will point to the scriptures. Even the heavens declare the glory of God. His creation. I mean, how can you intricately put a body together that after all these years, even of modern medicine, we kill, kill, still can't understand how the body works? You know, if you take your vehicle to a repair shop, a master mechanic can look at it, they can do tests on it, they can do various things, and they can say, this is your problem right here. I fix that, your vehicle's going to run. They fix it, and it runs. If it doesn't run, it's because they didn't fix all the problems. But when they find and identify the problems, and they can do that, then your vehicle's going to run. But people aren't that way. You can't go to the doctor and say, Doc, i got something wrong, and the doctor looks at you and says, Oh, yeah, here's what it is. Here, take this pill. You'll be okay in the morning. Doesn't work that way, does it? As cancer has invaded many bodies of people we know, uh, we still can't understand how it gets there and how to get rid of it as long as we've been working on it. I was just talking to Mary on the way here this morning and unrelated to this, and I, I said, so, but well, she did cancer research for years. I said, so tell me. I said, so in the area of cancer, how many people, I remember a music director at a church we were saved in, and the guy had cancer and he, he came and said, God, freedom of cancer, he had cancer no more. He died of cancer. I asked Mary, I said, how many people who've had cancer in your, your research and study actually are completely healed of cancer and don't have it anymore? She said, it's extremely rare. I said, is it common? Is it rare? Is it? It's very rare. It's very rare. I believe it takes a miracle of God to remove it because we don't understand how it gets there. We don't know how to cure it. We can improve the situation. We can knock off some cells and we can do some... Uh, some damage control. But in the end, cancer is going to win. I believe cancer is a malady that God has placed. We talked this morning about God causes grief in people's lives. It's because of sin. Most of the time, not always. Not always. I don't believe Stephen committed a sin to cause him to be stoned to death. But it was sin who got him there because the people that were stoning him had rejected Christ and had killed him. And so they were killing Stephen who was serving him. Folks, we need to understand, if we're going to be a servant of God, we have to know, we have to know the Scriptures and we have to abide by the Scriptures. And for Paul, who's writing this, as well as many other books, I wanted to point out the fact that it required total surrender to God. He was a slave of God. You don't have to be a preacher to be a slave of God. In fact, every born-again believer is the slave of God. Paul was associating himself with some Old Testament because at that time they didn't have a New Testament. He pointed to Old Testament patriarchs, prophets of God that God used in mighty ways and identified with them in order that he might gain uh, acknowledgement from others such as Titus, that this is really God's servant speaking to you, writing to you. And so... When many people have many different opinions about the Bible, a lot of people think the Bible is just fiction. Many people think the Bible is an important book, but it's not that important. Other people believe there's many other different ways to get to heaven. Worship whatever you want, your, your own God. Just worship your God and you'll be okay.
There are other people that are atheist and they just reject the concept of God altogether. Agnostics. There are people that just don't believe. And there are people that are head over heels into different religions of false gods. But Paul's trying to identify not only to Titus, but to us as well here today. There's only one God, and Paul served that God. And so what we have that's authored by Paul was inspired by God, and it's the truth. Every bit of it and every word. And it's written that we might believe according to John's gospel. That we might believe and put our faith in Christ. You can believe there's a God. You can believe that God, Almighty God, is God. The devil believes God. He, believe, he doesn't have faith in Him, but he believes He's real. So believing that God is real is not going to get you there. Doing some good things to try to appease God is not going to work. It may appear to work in our lifetime for some period of time, but what's really required is surrender. Surrender. Every child of God uh, loves and serves. We serve. We're saved to serve. And that service is not what we want. It's serving the one who is our master, the one who has bought us with the price of Christ's blood. We are obligated to perform for him whatever he wants. No, the world's not ours. The world belongs to the devil right now. And the Lord's going to upend that one day uh, because he's been victorious over death and he's gonna, that was the last enemy to be destroyed. And God will be victorious. The devil's having his heyday. But folks, in the, in the muddiness of what the world creates in our mind, what we need to do is understand there's one God, one Savior, Almighty God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came and died on a cross, paid the price, and bought our soul with His blood if we put our faith in Christ. God's grace makes that possible. And without that, we're lost and undone no matter what we think. So we can think all kinds of different things. The only right way to think is God's way. It's the only right way to think. Let's stand together, if you will. Father, it's, it's simple and sufficient enough to say, you are God. And you are the Savior of the world. And Father, you've made a plan of salvation so that any who would come and put their faith in Christ could be your possession, bought with the blood of Christ. And thus an heir of eternity through that saving grace, the shed blood of Christ, and the freedom from the bondage of sin. Father, for those who have not put their faith in Christ, may today be the day of their salvation. It's really simple. It's not complicated. It just requires a step of faith. But that faith means surrender. I acknowledge in the sinner's mind that God is God and Christ is the Savior of the world and the blood was shed for me and by God's grace I can be set free from the bondage of sin and be granted an eternity with God only possible through faith no amount of work no amount of cleanup no amount of effort will ever get a sinner to the throne of grace to be accepted as a child of God just simple, childlike faith. Father, save those who are lost here today. And Father, for those who have been saved, we need to ask ourselves if our surrender is full or if it's partial. What are we holding back? What are we still holding on to? Are we trying to straddle the fence? Lord, salvation is an all or nothing deal. We understand that. And Father, may it be in each of our minds that we're settled and sure that we have surrendered ourselves to you in faith. Put our confidence and our trust and our hope in the shed blood of Christ. And we'll give you thanks and praise for what you'll do in our hearts and our minds today.
and in the days ahead. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.